Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. March 17th. We made it to March 17th without a prospect profile. That's a record. And I'll say this was like a, this was a concession. This was a, this team is still technically in the hunt, trying to see who's going to fail the least out of all the teams fighting for a wild card spot. But we do have to start talking about prospects because of how far down they're falling. And so we're going to start with probably the most exciting prospect and the one that Detroit's least likely to get in Macklin Celebrini. But March 17th, we made it to March 17th without talking about prospects in the Detroit Red Wings 2024 NHL draft in general. So yeah, we're talking right after that Pittsburgh loss, which is <laughs> some choice words for sure after watching that game. But that's a small victory for us as a podcast. I just want it on record. I will be saying very little this episode because Ryan won't allow me to swear. As much as you want to swear. It's 90% of what I want to say after that game. That's right. And I just don't, we're already recording late and I can't be up late editing. As someone who has children also, I understand fully. <laughs> I, it's, I don't begrudge you for making me do it. I just want it on record. <laughs> All right, we are recording after the third of Detroit's three games since the last time we spoke, and it is a mixed bag today. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and for the first time this year, the NHL Draft. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. That was a sigh attached to that one. Yes. Can you blame him? No, I usually can, but no, not this time. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be discussing Detroit's three games, which is going to be a little bit of a topsy-turvy affair as we talk about the Arizona game, the Buffalo game, and then the Pittsburgh game. A little bit of a spoiler for you there. We'll talk about what's upcoming for Detroit, updates on Larkin's injury, please come back soon, and where the playoff race is. Race is a funny word, but we'll get into that. We're going to talk about Lucas Raymond and what he's doing in spite of the Red Wings' failure. Uh, we're going to be talking about Detroit's goalie situation and some other things, uh, Nate Danielson and what he's doing over with the Portland Winterhawks. And then we'll get into our prospect profile on Macklin Celebrini, the projected number one overall pick for this year's NHL draft. And then news from across the NHL and PWHL as they visited Detroit and more before we jump into overtime. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, you get access to some really great benefits like our Patreon exclusive winged wheel podcast discord, which is a fantastic community. You're automatically entered into all of our giveaways. For example, we're giving away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going directly to our Patreon supporters. Also in partnership with gear geek hockey right now, we're giving away a Patrick Kane pro stock stick. So our patrons are automatically entered into that and can double up by entering again on Twitter. So go to our Twitter account at Winged Wheel Pod or Gear Geeks to find out how to enter that. As well as those benefits, you also get access to our Patreon exclusive bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. We let loose, have some fun, and uh, just generally answer any questions that didn't come to the main show and just talk about whatever, hockey, not hockey stuff, whatever might come up. It's a good time. So again, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to join the so-called Dub Dub Club. Okay, it feels it feels depressing to start with the Arizona game, but we have to. And it, it, that's going to be a quick conversation because, you know, we said coming into it that the Arizona game was going to be Detroit's first opportunity to, you know, really turn the tides and you know, undo some of the bad play that came the week prior because they lost to Arizona and Buffalo in, in pretty terrible ways, those two games. Like they just should not have lost to those teams, period. And they were piss poor efforts. The Arizona game prior in Arizona, they lost four nothing. This game they needed to come out and make a difference and really, really, really turn the tides. As if to hearken memories from Red Wings past. I don't have a lot of strong opinions on that game right now. Because the Red Wings did so little, I barely remember most of it. The Essentially, the only good parts of that game were Lucas Raymond scoring on the power play to make it 1-1 from Patrick Kane. Nasty shot, though. Yes. 
great shot. And Lucas Raymond getting in the mix in front and Ben Chirac coming to his aid, which gave us a fun little storyline of, yep, practice is practice. And obviously these guys are teammates, like the visual of them in the box, like tapping each other on the pad saying, are you good? Like that was, that was the one sliver of fun you can draw from that game. Yeah, it was the great redeemer, hilarious visual, awesome to see that they've reconciled and, you know, Sherratt standing up for him after that. Did put the Red Wings shorthanded and did not show any passion the rest of the game, which was my whole irritation from the incident originally. So now I'm even more conflicted on how to feel because, yeah, it was a great moment in an otherwise unenthusiastic effort. The whole game was bad. Like the whole game was bad. There's just nothing else. Detroit's effort actually wasn't bad in general. Like you gave up the the first goal. Not great. It was shorthanded. Mo Sider stumbled. He blew a tire and then he made that a decision one, to. Yeah, that was bad luck. The second period effort, like they went down 2-1, but it really didn't feel like Detroit was out of it. And then Nick Bukestad scored in the third period to make it 3-1, about halfway through. And it just felt like Detroit phoned it in from there. And like they, it felt like they accepted that the game was over. And that's really just been the trend of what we've seen with the Red Wings. Like they perceive so many different moments as daggers and, and they put themselves on the back foot when even without Larkin, they do have the firepower to come back and it's hockey. Like how often has the narrative in a single hockey game changed over 60 minutes or more? Like the give up comes way too soon. And, and that Bugstad goal was effectively the end of the game. And that Bugstad goal was almost the perfect freeze frame to encapsulate the Red Wings D zone coverages of late. Cause there were, Four guys around or below the goal line as he was wide open in the slot. Just as soon as sh- other teams get the puck behind the net, both defensemen engage and then uh, opposing teams forward is wide open out front. It's craziness. The defensive stumbles and mistakes lead the team to just play so scared. It happened in December, but Dylan Larkin was talking about like, we're so scared to make defensive mistakes or, you know, compound on the defensive mistakes that are going to happen no matter what because the roster we lose capacity or the capability to do the most basic things and you can see it the entire team is just gripping their stick way too tight like they're just in their own heads that's a team that has no mental right now and that's how they were playing in that arizona game i do think the next game which we'll talk about in a second here it turned around but the arizona and the pittsburgh games like the, the team just wasn't they're they're just so in their own heads you know what was killer about the second loss to Arizona in a week? Arizona had six games. Their last six games leading up to that. Chicago, Minnesota, Detroit. Chicago, Minnesota, Detroit. Regulation loss, regulation loss, win against Detroit. Regulation loss, regulation loss, win against Detroit. They lost to Chicago and Minnesota twice each and beat Detroit twice. Pretty good. <laughs> you can't, any team, you love saying this, Evan, any team can be any team on the NHL. I'm not sure I think that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> on any given night. But that one was a little much for me. That was a little bit too annoying. Bad effort. Like, it was just a brutal effort. The takeaways were Dylan Larkin's impact continues to be underrated on this team, and it's still not an excuse for how poorly Detroit was playing. Regardless, they still weren't out of the playoff race at that point because everyone else around them keeps losing. And really, all that's happened is teams like Washington and for a second Buffalo and them and Tampa Bay's building some ground too. They're the ones who crawled back into the race. So it went from Detroit or the New York Islanders. Even Buffalo's sniffing around now. So it's it's just the the battle of the like which team is the most mid. It's no hot one's even potato good. right now. It's, Nobody wants it. It's rough. This is the best argument I've ever seen for not adding a play into the playoffs. <laughs> you want to add one more of these teams? <laughs> I This playoff race in the East has convinced me the playoffs in uh, should go to six per conference. Anyhow, that was Detroit. They lost 4-1 against Arizona at home. They had Buffalo Saturday afternoon, and we thought... Vibes were low. Vibes were, were low, and... I thought at that point in time, <laughs> I said, like, I know it's going to be a long time until they're mathematically at must win level. That's just the reality of, of 
the NHL where any game can t- randomly turn into a three point game. The three two one point system is a, a different conversation, but that one felt like a must win to me. Like you, you can't lose twice to Arizona and then twice to Buffalo. You need to show that you have the effort in you to at least make it a good game, like the Vegas effort, but better. Pretty poor start as Tage Thompson scored on the power play just over eleven minutes in. Like the 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 effort to that point wasn't bad. But that was a goal that went through Reimer's five hole. That was the furthest from being closed that I've ever seen. And I get he was screened by Jeff Petrie, who was kind of like half committed to the blocking the shot. But that one was just like a microcosm of what the concerns are with Reimer and Net is that the reaction time is so slow. That five hole was my mouth was a gape as much as his five hole was after that goal went in. And I thought, oh, here we go. Is that going to be Detroit? having a good effort and then one bad goal from a goalie and it's going to undo it. But you know what? They actually turned it around. That whole game went way better and they ended up winning 4-1 and it was just an effort that was so much better overall and much more indicative of what Detroit can do. It opened up scoring with Christian Fisher, who uh, a great diving play up front. He wasn't tripped or anything. He just, I think his joke was, I'm just not a very good skater. But a diving effort in front to score uh, credit to Michael Rasmussen, who made a great, a couple great efforts to keep the puck in and, and keep that play going. And then, really, to me, the play of the game was JT Confer diving stick in front to poke the puck to Patrick Kane, who put the puck in on the the right side, and that ended up being the game winner. But that JT Confer play, I was like, that's the kind of grind, the effort, the balls to the wall play you need to break out of a losing streak. Hmm. Weird effort led to a win. It was. It was. It's, it's it's simplistic, but it's the theme. It's absolutely the theme. I was so happy to see that the Red Wings' first two goals were literally created just by extra effort. Nothing fancy, not even really good plays to set everything up. Just, oh, I'm out of space here. Got to dive, make the play, whatever I can. And they both ended up in the net. It's, it, it's almost irritating that they won the game the way they did because that was really truly a complete game i don't think it was irritating i think that's what you wanted to see it's like a proof of life that's exactly what we wanted to see and it showed they can do it and it's just making me question why they're not doing it and why they haven't been doing it you know i was almost hoping it was just simply a system issue or a couple more guys are playing hurt than we thought but no we saw what this team can still be because it's what they were and they can still do it so Seven of the last eight games, they've just chosen not to. I have I have more on that. Like when we talk about the playoff race, I think that's just this is the cadence the Red Wings are going to be in until Larkin comes back. And I, I bet a little bit even after he comes back, unless the goalies get hot. But to finish off the game, Daniel Sprong scored through a double screen on the left side. It was really not a good shot to be letting in, but it was a good shot by Daniel Sprong, if that makes sense. And then Lucas Raymond as much as an empty net goal can be nice, Michael Rasmussen did a good job to find him in the middle. And, and Raymond actually had a nice move to kind of step around the defenders and score the empty net goal. And I love Raymond because he's just, you know, we talked about this, or you talked about this, Brad. Like, he deked around two defenders and then sallied extremely hard on an empty net goal. And that is, like, him and Sherratt scrum because those are probably the two most competitive, healthy Red Wings right now. And the way Lucas Raymond celebrated that goal, you could tell that that's just a guy who's extremely passionate. I think he's destined for an A on his sweater in the future. With Larkin out and understanding this team's one in seven in the last eight games, there is no question on the ice. Lucas Raymond has been the leader of this team yeah. in terms of production, in terms of leadership, in terms of effort, whatever you want to quantify it. Lucas Raymond has been the leader. That's a huge testament to him considering he turns 22 next week. But when a 21-year-old is the leader of your team, what's that saying about the rest of the roster? That was Raymond's 20th of the season at that point. Sider also played big minutes that game, and I think he did a much better job. Uh, The Red Wings did a much better job of shutting down Buffalo's best players. You're right, Brad. It was a much more complete effort. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm happy that the Red Wings lost the next day, but I am happy that they at least had this game against Buffalo because, again, I, I think it's a proof of life and... It's bad that they're not able to do so on a somewhat consistent effort, but 
I still think it's good to know that they can do this and they still haven't added Larkin back to the lineup and they still don't have good goaltending. So, I mean, actually credit to Reimer because after that five hole disaster, he cleaned it up the rest of the game and nothing else got past him. So the Red Wings did walk away with that win and it kept them in the playoff race. The next night was tonight. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting it to be back to the Arizona effort. That was surprising to me. That was the hope that the Buffalo game would have woken them up. The the fire under their butt to get them going. I, th- that's why the Buffalo game in hindsight is irritating to me. What the hell happened? From puck drop, it was roughly 15 minutes into the game by the time they registered their second shot on goal. Ballpark. The, in the Pittsburgh game you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, they it was the second period and they had... Three, four shots on goal compared to Pittsburgh's 19, and they were losing 3-1. They're like, playing a team that hasn't been able to stop a shot in a, ca- a calendar month. They've and been the, getting lit up by everybody. If there was, and that arena sounded like a funeral. Like Pittsburgh's dejected right now. If there was one other team in the league that was as listless as the Red Wings of late, it was Pittsburgh. Like this was, could have, Buffalo was their get-right game, and this was the build-some-momentum game. And... Arguably their worst effort of the this eight game stretch, just pitiful. Like I'm watching it in every shift, and I know this is such an overly simplistic cop out because there's a million other things you could go on about. Where I'm just watching guys not care. Like I was, we were talking before the episode. I highlighted a moment because I almost wanted you to screenshot it. It was so funny and sad at the same time. Where the Red Wings, the only dump and chase, nothing else style offense, but there's no chase. Like the chip and chase, dump and chase, whatever you want to call it. They don't win those battles. No, they're getting beat on pucks. There was battles everywhere. The one I saw and it was Patrick Kane and Alex to bring it. And I understand player type, not the guys you want leading a four check. I get it. They're probably not winning many battles in there. <laughs> it's the last body battle that Patrick Kane has won. Yeah. <laughs> but the defenseman, I think, was chipped it in, and Kane and Debrinka kind of drifted into the zone, got to about the hash marks, just kind of stood there, and and quite literally just let Pittsburgh break it out. I'm not saying they were going to win that four check. Had they went in, I would have bet my life savings they wouldn't have. But you have to at least try. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't win the battle, maybe if you disrupt the timing just enough, it's an errant breakout pass or he tries making maybe the wrong pass or he tries skating it when he should have passed. I don't know. Maybe you disrupt something, anything. And I'm picking on them because this was the most egregious incident of this game. I could point out 10 more. Where There's like two Red Wings, Lucas Raymond and Christian Fisher, really, who deserve positive credit from this game. Everyone else. It was, it was embarrassing. Like, my my whole like obviously I'm I'm angry tweeting throughout the game, and my comments are nothing but this has to be Lalone right this has to be Lalone right this has to and don't get me wrong he's got a million things to to his fault during this stretch, but I have a hard time identifying what exactly to blame him for, because whatever he's asking the players to do, they're not doing it. Like, this is the most listless, unenthusiastic, lazy stretch I have ever seen from an NHL team, especially one in a playoff race. Just the give a crap meter is at an all time low. It's almost unfathomable to watch some of the things that happened in an NHL team in a playoff race. Like, Chippen, did they recover one dump in today? Did they dive in front of any puck in in the D zone? How many hits were thrown? I understand everything you said last episode and this episode about no confidence. You're gripping your stick tighter. We've all been there. I know when I get to that point, I play like garbage. I don't have my hands. I'm missing the net. I'm not making plays. We've all been there. No, personally, I can't relate, but go on. But the great redeemer? Effort. If I can't score a goal, I can hit someone. I can block a shot. I can be the first on a four check. 
I can disrupt something the other team's trying to do. Yeah. It's the great redeemer. And then eventually you have a puck bu- like bouncing off your ass or something because you were crashing the net and you feel like a million bucks and you slowly start to get it back. It's not happening with this team. It's it's pitiful. And hockey's a game of good karma. Yeah. And there's been we'll, we'll get into it later when we talk about it, but there's been almost no accountability, which is probably my biggest fault of a loan through this whole stretch. Some of the uh, the biggest storylines as well. Like I, I don't think all of the goals are on him and the ones that were were kind of a gray area, but Alex Lyon isn't doing any like at best he is average right now. Like average? He, no, no. At, but no, no, at best, at the best points in the game he's average. On average, he's been poor. Like the Detroit does not have a hot hand in net. And we're going to have a conversation about Detroit's future in net later on, but Detroit right now does not have a hot hand. They do have, I think, James Reimer, who is less off at the moment. And that's bad because James Reimer, like, they didn't start him on the back-to-back with travel, even though Derek Lalonde was thinking about it. And I think he made the right call. But you can also completely understand why he was thinking about it because right now Alex Lyon looks late to pucks and he looks like he can't make the exceptional save to bail out the the piss-poor defense. James Reimer can't really that often, but he sometimes does and does find ways through whatever black magic goes on in that net because I'll tell you it's not conventional goaltending sometimes sometimes it looks awful but a lot of times you're like oh none of those shots went in and Detroit has actually only let one or two goals in when in recent games for Lyon they've they've all been going in I feel for him because I don't think he gets to this point unless he gets shelled like the the Red Wings defense is allowing him to get shelled right now but the Red Wings are currently in a position where they have one goalie who's perpetually injured, who was supposed to be their starter all year. One goalie who saved a big chunk of their season, but now is completely worn to the ground, which how many times have we heard that story? And one goalie who was decidedly their third string, who is now their only chance at maybe not losing a game. Like the Red Wings goaltending is ice cold. And that's not the only issue, but that's like you have no foundation anymore. Your offense, as Brad just outlined, is not competing in such a way that to, to help your team maintain possession or win battles or, or keep sustained pressure. Your defense is bad on paper and on the ice, and your goaltending is not saving you anymore. Like, it's a recipe for a 6-3 loss to the Penguins, and I think 6-3 was a generous score. Like The three goals that the Red Wings scored very quickly, Lucas Raymond with a sick rip. Uh, David Perron did a great job to uh, win a body battle and, and get the puck to Raymond, who sniped it past Nedeljkovic. Christian Fisher scored in front from Rasmussen. Fisher, who didn't score for like 41 games and then scored in back-to-back games, so good for him. And then Raymond, again, on a late power play. Detroit had the the net pulled, and Kane found Raymond in front, who buried it. Raymond's 22nd goal of the year uh, tied his career high in points at 57. That's that's the full... That's all I can say positive for the Red Wings that game. Other than that, it's comprehensive right now what's going poorly. It's... You outlined it perfectly because I wanted to talk about that today. It's a cascade effect. The forwards cannot and do not maintain possession in the ozone. They cannot set up a cycle. They cannot get chances. It's puck, chip, barely a chase, Pittsburgh out, break in the other way. And Prashanth had a thread on Twitter. We did a really great job of outlining just how bad their chip and chase is and showing how other teams are getting chances off of it. So your offense can't maintain possession or do basically anything at all. So that puts a ton of extra stress on the defense because they have to be defending damn near all game. So they're going to get, no matter how bad they are, even good defense are going to get worn out and tired and make mistakes when that's happening. That's been the name of game uh, for Cider all year. Exactly. And when when you do that to an already bad defense Mm -hmm. it's gonna turn your goalie's life into a nightmare and should lion be facing the number of a plus chances he's been facing no absolutely not should he be stopping some of them yeah he should is he no everybody's at fault and everybody's making everybody else worse Mm -hmm. it's a full system failure dylan larkin before we get into the the playoff race. Let's give an update on Dylan Larkin. It doesn't sound optimistic for him to return for Tuesday against Columbus. Uh, Derek Lalonde did not have a lot of optimism that he would be back early, which very obviously didn't happen. So we are at, you know, the two week mark. 
and Columbus doesn't look likely. So we're talking realistic best case scenario unless something changes. Like maybe Monday he feels way better or he has just pissed off enough watching what's happening in front of his eyes and he comes back against Columbus. But really the best case scenario is that he returns for Thursday against the Islanders at home, which may be – that could be it. Right? That could right be the there. tipping point to see if Detroit is is actually truly in this race for much longer. Not that they would again. The ma- the mathematically part of it comes much later in the season, and anything can happen. But they have fourteen games left, and if you, you lose a four point swing like that to the Islanders, you have Washington again on Tuesday. Those two games are going to decide really how much you're in this race. So Detroit has to pray and hope. That Larkin is back because can Larkin fix the goaltending? No. Will Larkin fix the defense? No. But follow that cascading effect that Brad was just talking about. So much of that starts and ends with Dylan Larkin allowing other players to slot where they need to slot in the lineup. And all of a sudden your lines can match up a lot better. All of a sudden your lines mesh a lot better. And let's call it what it is. Dylan Larkin is a fantastic number one center for the Red Wings and can drive a lot of play on the ice, drive a lot of puck possession, drive a lot of momentum. And frankly, your captain's you would hope isn't going to let this team crumble like they are. This team has crumbled mentally without him. Is it a coincidence? Maybe. Is it this stomach bug that went around the room? I'm sure to some degree. Is it somewhat on the fact they they don't have the leadership without Larkin? I have to assume yes. So, you know, if Dylan Larkin's not back for Tuesday, you have to hope for Thursday. If he's not back for Thursday, then we need to poll all of our listeners to see whoever has the healthiest lower body and you're going to have to donate it to Dylan Larkin. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll have to find the finest cadavers in all of Detroit. <laughs> like we, this team is, this is just what it is. Like I've accepted. I talked a couple episodes ago. I've accepted this is what it is. Detroit is going to be able to put together some performances, but as long as Larkin is out, they're, this is just a manifestation of what their roster is. And as long as their goalies are cold, you can't cover it up. It sounds like I'm uh, resigned in accepting poor hockey and, and what fate might be for the Red Wings. And I'm not saying they might, they're, they're guaranteed to miss the playoffs because, you know, the Islanders have lost four in a row and they could fall into the playoff spot. But I feel like until Larkin is back, this is what the case is going to be for Detroit. I'll say for, I'll say I'm a fence sitter at this point. How I not feel you. about I have no strong opinion one way or another. <laughs> When I don't see any team around them really making a push to to take this the final wild card slot and the Red Wings kind of fumbling about, it's hard to really you know feel you know super anxious about where they're sitting, right? Like it's like yeah, the Red Wings you know tonight uh, by points are still in that wild card <laughs> slot, so it's hard for me to be super upset, even though it's like been brutal to watch. And on the other hand, it's very hard for me to be optimistic. Because of how brutal it's been, even yeah. though they are in a playoff spot right now. So I have a really tough time. And I think, you know, maybe we should have looked at the goaltending a little bit with some a better pair of glasses on. Because we could, probably should have seen a bit of a regression coming. And I don't know if I just thought Alex Lyon would just be the savior the whole season. And James Reimer would figure it out and Billy Husa would come back. But now that we've, you know got some hindsight behind us and can look back at it this goaltending trio maybe wasn't a recipe for success and you know the teams that really do make the playoffs they either have elite players like the toronto maple leafs but are lacking a goaltender or they have the stud goaltender and they those guys can bail them out when they have bad games right now i'm just i'm not i'm not blaming this all on goaltending like the whole thing is brutal to watch but it is very difficult for me to feel one way or another on this sunday evening given all that. So the the standings position Detroit's in right now, Evan's not wrong. By points, they're still technically in a wild card spot. They are in the second wild card spot. They have 74 points in 68 games. Right ahead of them, the Tampa Bay Lightning have 78 points in 67 games. The catch is Detroit behind them have two teams who can pass them with their games in hand. Washington, Washington, who was written off not long ago, they've won two in a row. They're six and four in their last 10. They are two games in hand on Detroit, and they're only one point back. And the Islanders lost in regulation again today, and Detroit failed to capitalize. So the Islanders, with their game in hand, can pass Detroit. Behind them, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, New Jersey. They're a little further back. I'm not going to say anyone's out of it at this point. But really, this is Washington and the Islanders who can 
control whether or not Detroit makes it here. The good news for Detroit, and I say that with a big fat grain of salt, but the good news for Detroit is that they play both of those teams. So you want to make up those games in hand, you got to win those games in regulation. Yeah, those games basically are going to determine what the outcome of the wild card spot is, right? Like those are two four point games with teams who've got games in hand and nobody seems to want this wild card spot. So damn it, someone is going to have to <laughs> willfully accept that they will be bad and make that wild card spot. Detroit just ran Washington's show what seems like centuries ago. I know. In in spirit, but not like a couple of weeks ago. And they lost a game to the Islanders that honestly could have gone either way. Those teams are both – Detroit can beat both of those teams. Yes. They'll need two things. They'll need Dylan Larkin and they'll need their goaltenders to have a night. It, your point, Evan, that I really like there and I want to build on it. What did I say? That's I forgot that you need to be reminded – just re- repeat it, please. <laughs> Evan Dory from Finding Nemo, Lob Singer. It's, you can't blame all of it on goaltending. But there's two things that Detroit can fix right now reasonably. You can't fix the defense. That has to happen in the offseason. You can't fix you know the forward makeup to a lesser degree. That has to happen in the offseason. You can do two things. One, Dylan Larkin can get healthy. And two, the same as any other team or goalie in the league, your goalies can get hot again. That's Detroit's lifeline. A healthy Larkin. And your goalies do enough to to cover up the flaws. At practice, I'm shooting everything into their pads, making them feel like they are Martin Broder. With the way the Red Wings forwards are shooting them right now, they might <laughs> dome them. They actually just dump it into the corner and try to establish the cycle. <laughs> they don't even take the shot on net. <laughs> <laughs> they somehow lose the battle. There's yeah, no on one a, on the other they team. They chip and chase on a breakaway. They just oh overskate God. the puck and then Newsy comes in and collects it for the next drill. <laughs> There's a there's a story I saw from a I can't I can't remember what famous Premier League soccer player it was, but he was telling a story of like this team was on an extreme run bad. It might have been like Aston Villa or something, and they were in practice and they were practicing like just them with no opponents, like just formations and stuff. And they practiced the kickoff, and there was just some comedy of errors, and they scored on their own net. Oh they my were God. they were down one nil to nobody. If that happens in the <laughs> if, if that happens in the Red Wings practice, I then I'll know how to feel. That's the energy you've got right now. Yeah. Oh my god. On Please. that hilariously uh, uh, pessimistic note, why don't we jump into a quick break here uh, to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian pilsner is a delicately balanced beer. Brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So... Head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older, and as always, enjoy responsibly. All right, welcome back. Evan, you were just talking about the goaltending, and we've talked plenty about the goaltending so far this season. We know the story. You know, Lion was hot and then now bad. Reimer has been a mixed bag and has been randomly stealing games. Other times it's been bad. Huso was bad. And then kind of looked like he was on the up and then is now injured forever. That's that. Until they get hot or whoso gets healthy, that will follow that story. The Red Wings goaltending moving forward, though, is a question. Because what do you do? People are saying, oh, bring up Kosa for right now. And I think, oh God. I think do oh not God. do that. <laughs> do not, Se- please. <laughs> He's a great guy. Let's not do that to Sebastian Kosa. He did nothing to deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> and for a goalie who you have to build up... I mean, we asked Sebastian Kosa if he agreed with the, the scouting report that he's a goalie of high talent that needs a lot of refinement and experience. He said, yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Bringing him up early for a defense that will offer him no support to me is a recipe for disaster, or unless I'm crazy. I That would be the absolute worst decision ever. So, you know, if he steps in and takes a role next year, then that's a, a answer solved. But I think 
the more conservative, probably more likely timeline if Coates is to be successful is the season after next is when he really starts knocking on the door. Late season goaltending failures in Detroit is has become a trend. I know Steve Eisman was around on some goalies around the deadline. He he's known this has been an issue all year. I think Markstrom was a target, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him try to compete with New Jersey for Markstrom in the summer. Is that the move in the offseason? What do you do in the offseason to to try to solve this moving forward? So I think I've come to what my ideal solution is. And I want to preface this by saying I don't like any option available to the Red Wings right now, short of getting really creative or another team doing something unexpected. But factoring in what they have in the system, timelines, who they have under contract, which for right now is Huso and Lion for next year, and what acquisition costs will be for certain goalies on the market, Again, estimates of what you think they would cost. I think for me, if I'm Steve Eisenman, the play is John Gibson. That's what I was going to say. Interesting. I think the acquisition cost for Markstrom and Saros would be way too high for where Detroit is at and when, like how much team control you get over those guys. I don't like John Gibson as much as those two. I think he's the inferior goalie, but you get uh, an extra year or two comparatively, albeit he's older, at a reasonable cap hit. He's not a world beater anymore. He was, for a time there, one of the best goalies on the planet. But he's still good, and you know what you're getting out of him, and you know when healthy he can play a full season. The Red Wings keep trying these unproven goalies who collapse at the end of the year. I don't think that can be the formula anymore. When healthy is a big thing for Gibson, though, right? Yeah, but you ha- you're going to have at least one of Husso or Lyon next year. And I trust both those guys fully in a backup role as a, or even like as a one B like Lyon playing 30 games would be perfect. Yeah, exactly. If if all you get out of John Gibson next year is 45 games. Fine. I think Lyon could handle that load. I think Husso could handle that load. I don't think Lion or Huso could handle 50 to 60 games. So you got to go get a proven, established NHL starter. Again, other guys might shake loose, but out of the ones that are reportedly available, I think Gibson makes the most sense. And the Verbeek Eiserman connection, mm-hmm. the, the, there could be mutual favors done there because obviously Anaheim wants to unload cap. Detroit needs a goalie. They're both hard ass negotiators, but that could be eased up by dealing with each other because they're friends of the same mindset. I don't love this solution, but I don't see a better one. And given that I think I think it's three more years for Gibson after yep. this. Three more years for Gibson at six point four, two more years for Markstrom at six. Perfect. Three years? That sounds like Kosa's timeline to be a starter to me. You let Kosa Kosa split this season with Hutchinson in Grand Rapids. Next year in Grand Rapids, Kosa should be the guy, Mm -hmm. and then depending how that season goes, the year after, he's probably in NHL backup territory or maybe one more year in the A to, like, really get comfortable playing 50-ish games as the guy, and then he's starting to push. By the time Gibson's contract is up, you're hoping at some point in that last year and a half, Kosa's pushing. There's a conversation about... Is Gibson the backup this year? Do we let Kosa take the reins? Or as that contract expires, you don't have to worry about finding a goalie because you've had, you know, a year of Kosa playing 35 games where he's like, yeah, he's ready. So to me, that's the best option available. But if this team wants to take a step forward, which is part of a bigger conversation, which I don't necessarily think they should do, but if they do, they can't, they can't go who's so lying next year. They can't. Right now, they have James Reimer at one point five million, uh, like th- this season, and Vili Husso at four point seven five million for this season and next. Uh, Alex Lyon is on a nine hundred thousand dollar per year contract this season and next. So here's the thing: Reimer comes off the books. You know, credit to Reimer for doing what he's been able to do, bafflingly at at points for Detroit this season, but he's still done it. And you still have to say you're going to let him go as an unrestricted free agent. The absolute worst case scenario is that you need a third string guy and he comes back for league minimum. But let's say he goes. That's $1.5 million off the books. And then if you work Vili Husso in to a return for either Markstrom or Gibson. Markstrom's 34 years old, by the way. Gibson is 30. Gibson turns 31 in the summer. You 
if you ship Huso in his last year back and you're able to get, let's say, Gibson, who has a 10-team no trade, or, or Markstrom, who has a full no move, but I think at this point he's pretty sick of Calgary and, and the runaround they've given him, you pay a little bit more in terms of assets, picks, prospects, whatever. I'm pretty willing to do that. You're right, Brad. You got to solve the problem. You you do. And I understand, Brad, your your trepidation with moving forward, and we're not having that conversation today. It's a little bit more, let's see how the season goes, and that's off-season conversation. I'm personally of the mind that Eisman's locked in, both in terms of what he wants and the, the trajectory he's put the Red Wings on to try to move forward. To me, you have to solve the problem. You bring in 30-year-old John Gibson and you have Alex Lyon for next year and you're very good points about Kosa. And let's not... You can really ease Kosa into the NHL if you can lock John Gibson up for the twilight of his career. And, and I also want it on record. Wherever we come to in that offseason conversation about hitting the gas or not, the goaltending still needs to be solved. It does. So this, this, that would not change okay, my opinion yeah, on this. Yeah, yeah. And Trey Augustine's not far behind either. So if you're sitting here saying, well, that's a big if on Kosa, and of all prospect positions, the ones that have the biggest if, even when they seem certain, is goaltending. Like, let's call that what it is. You have Kosa and Augustine who have both had really great years. And that's behind Kosa as well. So... To me, those are a couple good solutions. I don't know, Evan, if you have a different opinion, but I don't think that you should be trying to come back. The only reason you should try to come back with, you know, who's so lion is if you can get absolutely nothing else done. Because as much as you say, well, you have to be a good GM at some point and get things done, a top goaltender is going to be the hottest commodity on the market right now. Like, I, I don't even think it needs to be a top goaltender per se. Gibson's, again, in terms of, a known Everything. commodity is what you're looking for. It, consistency. I want a goalie who's going to play 55 games. If it's at 55 games of 908 or 55 games of 916, obviously I'd prefer the 916, but if the best you can get is a 908 guy, please do it. It's better than what what they've been getting and again, year after year, this defense breaks these goalies and they're unproven, they're not used to it. They can't hold up. Like I don't know who the best example around the NHL would be of a mediocre guy that is very capable of starting, but they're out there. And if that's your best option, so be it. Can I say something that's going to piss you off? You do it all the time. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not sold on this idea, but just for the sake of, of one pissing Brad, when off, you look at me before <laughs> you say it, I know it's going to be funny. 50% retained. And maybe they have to pay you to take it. Jack Campbell. I said I want someone who's proven they can play 50. <laughs> we just, just got younger James Reimer. <laughs> like, I, I, un I understand you, your train of thought, but you just picked the worst goalie imaginable. Can you imagine <laughs> Jake Campbell's mental, uh, his mental strain behind the Red Wings defense? <laughs> he Are a, you kidding me? <laughs> he had a Connor McDavid and couldn't crack it. Like, no. <laughs> I don't actually believe in that option, but just in the interest, because I was looking at, like, what goalies could possibly be available and, like, do you think Vimelka could return to form? He lost his net to Ingram, who has been fantastic all year. Do you think, are you, I don't know, are you going to try to take Merzlikens? Like, what else is out there? It's, I think Gibson and Markstrom are going to be the two most, I understand they're the, the, the two probably top of the list, but in terms of consistency, I think it's also the same two guys. So Merzlikens might be the goalie I'm thinking of in terms of the, he's mostly mediocre, but you know he can play a full season. He's not the guy because that contract's atrocious, but that is along the, like, it's better than what we have. I wouldn't touch that contract with a 10-foot pole, but that that's the right track. I think the most difficult one that could get done, but one that has kept cropping up amongst everyone in the hockey world is, what is happening with Linus Allmark and, and Swayman? Mm -hmm. What are they doing with either one of those guys? That trade would be impossible to do but i think we wouldn't be doing our due diligence if we didn't include that in this overall holistic look at the nhl goaltending landscape i'm sure ryan's looking it up right now but i feel like linus allmark's contract status would well, make that a no fly one more year at five yeah. million yeah exactly with a modified no trade clause 16 team no trade list right now 15 team no trade list for next season but to me if you're shipping huso the other way you're more than offsetting that salary. Swayman is an but RFA after this season. It's not the contract there that I'm worried about in terms of dollars. It's, 
Are you giving up a first round pick and a top prospect for one year of a goalie? Yeah, it's it's tough. If you if there's a contract extension negotiated in there, for sure. The thing is, Allmark's thirty, and I think of the him or Gibson. Allmark's going to get paid more than Gibson, and he's going to cost more than Gibson. That's why I landed on Gibson. Yeah, you're going to give up less to get him. He's not going to be as good, but you also have three years of reasonable cost. Not good cost, but reasonable. What's Allmark going to get on his next deal? Eight, nine? Like Boston isn't going to pay that. No, but someone will. It, honestly, if he goes to UFA, it'll probably be Detroit. And it, and this is <laughs> Allmark kind of gets into that Johnny Goudreau situation where it's like, yeah, we want this guy to help us win, but he's expiring, and we know we've got two goalies who can play at the NHL level, what do we do with them? Do we just try and get a return? Do we keep them as our quote-unquote trade deadline acquisition? It's it's going to be very interesting in Boston. I I personally have no idea how you would make that trade work interdivision. I don't know. There, there, now that we've sort of done a bit of a deep dive on it, I think there are lots of great options that the Red Wings could explore. I think it will obviously be the cost and – Guys like Saros and Markstrom are very popular amongst the NHL talk and trade talk. So they would probably cost a lot. Gibson would be an interesting pick for sure. This is off-season content at this point. So I think let's move on to to maybe the Red Wings the, now. The next off-season t- topic, which is the prospect profile. You want to no, do that no, now? No, not yet. I, I want to give Lucas Raymond his flowers, which is like the fifth time we've done that in the last seven episodes. But this guy currently leads the team in points. Dylan Larkin you know, has missed 13 more games than uh, Lucas Raymond. Like Dylan Larkin's at 55 games played, Raymond's at 68. But Raymond, with 14 games to play, has tied his career high in points, 57 points, already passed the 20-goal mark, and is right now essentially carrying the team on his shoulders in terms of leadership, in terms of energy on the ice, in terms of actual production, in terms of skill and talent displayed, in terms of competitiveness, everything. Lucas Raymond is... Uh, right now, with Dylan Larkin out, he's the face of the Red Wings. And he's the only thing that you can really draw on as a positive over the Arizona game and the Pittsburgh game. This guy is making his next contract. First of all, what a hell of a contract year. Great bounce back year. Uh, egg in the face of anyone who's willing to write off a guy after a you know average to a, maybe a bit streaky sophomore season, which is very normal in the NHL, especially for a guy of Raymond's size. But he is just, he has found another level. We were talking about it before, and we did a whole piece on it before, but what has really impressed me even more is that that level didn't go away when Larkin left. Like He's still out there driving play on his lines. You tweeted at some point tonight, Detroit's getting caved on every offensive shift unless it's Raymond's line out there. And it, and I say Raymond's line. I could have just said Raymond. Yeah. Perron hasn't been great. vleno has been invisible. It's been Raymond. And Perron did have a great setup to Raymond today, like using his body to win that puck, but... Hey, if you want to isolate moments, I'm sure I could find at least one right now, for most of the <laughs> roster. But, and it's not just that he's been good, it's he's been, it's the plays he's been making. Mm-hmm. There are high skill plays in traffic with little time, whether it's a shot, a pass. His biggest progression as a player this year has probably been understanding time and space. If you look at his first goal this year, or this year, his first goal tonight, he took... a thousand years ago, his first goal this year. He took every second he had before that back checker got to him to absolutely load up that shot because he knew he had it. He didn't rush it. And then the next goal, on and off his stick because he he knew he had no time and space. Mm -hmm. You watch him along the boards battling. He will hold it. For exactly as long as he needs to. And he will make a play, whether that's a deke or a pass, based on what's available to him. It is what elite players do. When we talked about him and like the traits that he would need to steal from someone like Kucherov to take that next step, this is it. And you we talked about he doesn't have a one timer. I gotta tell you, I felt I felt a little something when he hammered that one tee against Arizona. I'm like, that's it. That's the shot. If he puts that in his bag of tools regularly, like we might be talking about a guy who's flirting with 80, 90, dare I say a hundred points in the next four or five years. 
as scoring goes up, I, I never thought it was crazy for him to be an 80, 90 point guy. And to me, if you can be an 80, 90 point guy, like how are you going to put a hard cap on what your progression is? Mind you, it's not a guarantee and it's hard to be that, but with the right players around you and if he keeps progressing, I think that's absolutely within the realm of possibility. It's not gear. Again, it's not a promise, but he had the, the tools are all there. <laughs> he, he's real. You said he's carrying the team. He's carrying them through a swamp. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's remarkable what he's been doing. Someone was tweeting at me. They're like, yeah, but he's like a dash 10. I'm like, you don't think that has anything to do with the other four guys on the ice with him. Every time he steps on the ice the last four weeks, uh, I, was, I, I can't listen to plus minus while the entire, while if the goalies are letting in the goals that they're letting in, if the defense is doing what the defense is doing, I don't want to hear about plus minus. Yeah, I, do, you, I, I, do you expect Raymond to be the first guy back defending? Do you expect him to step in the crease and make the saves? Like what, what? What more could this guy possibly do during this losing streak than he has already been doing? The rest of the team seems to need to rely on the uh, the octopus magic that uh, the listener Real Medic CJ did. He put up a video of like preparing the octopus to toss on the ice, and he threw it on the ice for the Buffalo game, and that's the only reason they did great for the Buffalo game. Raymond seems to be not in need of that. So, yeah, everyone else needs a little bit of voodoo to, to show up. So I credit to Raymond is what we're trying to say. All right, let's jump into some prospect talk. Before we get into Macklin Celebrini, our first prospect profile, uh, Red Wings prospect, Nate Danielson in a 11-1 to win that the Jesus. Winter Hawks yeah, had over the Americans. He had two goals, two assists, was a plus five. I'm talking about plus minus because I think that's funny. The game after, a goal and two assists. In 25 games, he has, with Portland, he has 12 goals, 24 assists for 36 points compared to I believe it's around 26 games with Brandon to start the year. He had 12 goals, 14 assists. So in around the same period of time, he's increased his points by 10. So exactly what we want to see from Nate Danielson, we're seeing. In big blowout games, he is a big factor in why. Like Nate the Great is what they talk about him as over there, and he's showing up in a big way for for Portland. Well, the talking point for years with him was, what would happen if you gave him better line mates? Is he just limited offensively, or is... The team around him limiting him. Wow, oh, feels like a conversation we just had about someone else. And turns out it was the teammates around him, which is great sign. It's a, it's a good thing he could still do it in Brandon, though, because reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Infer what you will. Let's move on. Macklin Celebrini, center for Boston University, you know, tearing it up in college this year and presumptive number one overall pick in the 2024 NHL draft. He is, he has been really throughout his entire development path, assumed to be the number one overall pick and nothing really has changed this year to move him off that spot. And he looks to be potentially a high end, maybe even superstar two way center for a team in the future. So who is Macklin Celebrini? What's his game and how does he compare to first overall picks of the past? He's a really interesting one because he doesn't fit the, description of a typical number one overall pick where you can isolate a trait and go, yeah, that's special. You you got like Jack Hughes's skating. Oh no, he's Shane Wright. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, in the mold of sure, but even Shane Wright had the shot. Celebrini's really good at everything. Like he's a good skater, good puck handler. Good shot, all above average. And I'm not saying this to to demean any of those skills. Like you put him up against other players his age. These skills are better than most, if not all. But what separates him is the completeness of his game and his intelligence on the ice. The hockey IQ is through the roof and we've beat to death over the years. That's not something you can teach. You have it or you don't. And this guy's is the best in the draft by a mile. And we saw what he did at the World Juniors for a really weak year for Canada. He's dummying the NCAA this year as a 17-year-old. I think he's the youngest player in college hockey. He is. Which he is got crazy. He got he fast-tracked his schooling yeah, to be he, able to play this he, year. He would be a grade 12 technically. Yeah. And he's playing in the NCAA. Most NCAA prospects in the draft are because they were a post-September late birthday. So they finished their high school and then went to college. He fast-tracked. He shouldn't even be there right now. Not only is he there, I think he's leading the nation in scoring. Like It's 
bonkers what he's been able to do at 17 years old. And, you know, even though he doesn't have that one trait, like that pulls you out of your seat when you're watching him, you can't find a flaw in this guy's game. You can't find something he's not great at. I think the craziest thing about him, given all of that, is he is so young and is doing this at the NCAA level that I think he will develop either one of those traits that really is his MO or he's going to become exceptional at everything and just raise the bar of all his skills. So, man, it's crazy what this kid can do at his age. It'll be very interesting to see how much he can really keep pushing that potential over the next year, two years, and then obviously into his NHL career. And I think there is something to the comparison bias that you get because the NCAA is a a much better league than the CHL in terms of quality of hockey just because you get more 19, 20, 21, 22, 23-year-olds playing against. This guy was in junior hockey right now. He'd be... Oh, on pace for over 150 points, and his skills would pop a hell of a lot more exactly. because of how much better he would be than everybody else on the ice. I think when you see the way first overall picks have gone either direction over the years, you see someone like Macklin Celebrini, who isn't a late riser and has kind of been, you know, at the top of his peers, and to to do what he's doing with the age and the physicality discrepancy that you, Brad and Evan, just outlined, that has to be such a big vote of confidence for. GMs like you're not looking at Shane Wright who made the mistake of taking his year off of hockey and instead of he waited around the OHL in the COVID year which is really kind of unfair to a lot of the players but in retrospect he should have done the Austin Matthews thing and gone overseas but Macklin Celebrini has taken his own kind of atypical route and one that's exceptionally tough and in the style of game that he plays this guy is you you have way more confidence that he is going to pan out in such a way where you're like, yeah, this he should appreciate as most of what he can be as a player and a prospect because of the path that he's taken, the test he's put himself through even before the NHL, and frankly, a number one two-way center that could potentially be a superstar. And just because you say two-way doesn't mean he doesn't have a wicked shot, elite hockey IQ, that kind of thing. Like He's a full package. You're completely right. He does everything well. I need to add this in now before we forget to say it. This is the most unlikely pick for Detroit to have. I know I'm stating the obvious, but we're not talking about Macklin Celebrini because, oh, if Detroit misses the playoffs, you know, you have a chance to get him. If Detroit misses the playoffs, they're likely going to be one of the lowest odds to even win the lottery. And if they win the lottery, they move up 10 spots, which isn't first overall. I will so. die. I I honestly... Out the okay, window. Here's, out I the will window. go out the window. Here's an honest question, because I, I actually was thinking about this on the drive over, and I'm curious where you guys land. If the Red Wings miss the playoffs by one point, and they are the lowest seed in the draft lottery, so which would be 16, if they win and jump up to six, are you happy or angry? I'm both. I Both by a lot. Yes, I think you can be both. You have to be both. You're not going to be mad about getting an extra sixth overall pick. That could be Catton. It could be... Uh, Demidov, it could be Booyam, could be a lot of guys who you need and could help you. Absolutely. I will die. But what the f***? If now? I, my first reaction, my initial guttural reaction would be rage. Yeah. Of all the first overall picks we miss and then we get back to six? <laughs> I will die. Uh, uh, the next day, I would talk myself into it and be very happy and start running through all the immaculate prospects that would be available there. Totally. But I, my first reaction, I'm punching a hole through the wall. Hundred, like, you can't... That is some cosmic BS. Like, that is just the hockey... Go- That's the ultimate prank by the hockey gods. Like, the, the lab scientists who run this specific simulation that's known as our universe. Like, that's them just having some fun with the test subjects. It's cruel and unusual. The amount of fame we would get off of it from the confused people clipping our draft lottery live stream, cursing, swearing, <laughs> punching things as the Red Wings win the draft lottery would be something else. Would you say no? Like, no or yes? I think I would just scream. I think okay, I would just, okay. I, my face would be neutral. I don't even know what my initial reaction would be. I would say words that Ryan's not letting me say this episode, and it would start with, <laughs> are you? Fill in some gaps and end with kidding me. A lot of gaps. So like for somehow 17 words. Yes. Anyhow, Macklin Celebrini. I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of time for this guy as a first overall pick, which isn't like a, I'm just looking at first overall picks of the past. Like 
not to knock the guys, but Owen Power, Slavkovsky, those were first overall picks that weren't cut from the same cloth as, you know, Jack Hughes. And what we thought at the time, and maybe the the most disappointing prospect in the last X number of years, uh, Alexi Lafreniere. But to hey, me, he helped us today. He did. Don't you besmirch the good name of Alexi Lafreniere. And I still, anyways, but Macklin <laughs> Celebrini is going to be, a, a, I think, a game changer for a team. I don't know that you're talking the same level as Jack Hughes. I asked you about that before the podcast. I'm like, someone said that to me and I said, I'm not certain, but I don't think it's impossible. I think if they were in the same draft, if we, you know, sent Celebrini back in time, I, I think Hughes goes ahead of him, mm-hmm. but he, he'd he probably be number two. I just hope San Jose doesn't ruin him. <laughs> San Jose should be so lucky. Okay. Moving on here. Uh, some quick news from across the world of hockey. We'll save the NHL news, uh, the PWHL news. Detroit broke the U.S. attendance record for a PWHL game. Uh, Almost 14,000 people were there. It was excellent to see the LCA show up for the PWHL. I love all the noise that's being made for Detroit to hopefully get a uh, Detroit Professional Women's Hockey League franchise. Like that is, I love that. I also love the the story of Jesse Comfer. And her having the support of her brother JT and all the Red Wings as they went uh, came into Pittsburgh and her and the Toronto PWHL team because they still don't have names uh, won today. But I thought that was really really exciting to see the PWHL do so well in Detroit, and I hope this is just another big step to having a PWHL team in Hockey Town. What do we name the team? The Detroit Detroits. I've I'm, I said it before. I'm a big fan of. I don't know if you can do it. But if you can take the old Detroit Vipers jerseys team name, I love that. But well, they would be Detroit PWHL hockey team for a year. Which is better then, than the team names that they chose to start. Yeah. Detroit Vipers would be good. Falcons. Falcons would be sweet. That would be it. I, although I don't mind the idea of them just starting a whole new identity instead of just banking off of Detroit Coney Island Dogs. My God. One dollar, one dollar, Glizzy's. One dollar, Evan Island would be dogs. the first season ticket buyer. <laughs> he would, he'd be the, he would buy a whole section of, of seats just to make sure there was fewer people in line as he got his one dollar <laughs> hot dogs. Anyhow, uh, congratulations to the very successful Comfort family and the PWHL for their, it, this is a really smart way to do it. Like go to different markets and show off the league and the game. Well, awesome it's, it's market research. Can Pittsburgh, can Detroit, can, you know, whatever other cities they play in, support a team. Montreal had like over 19,000 people show up, right? Well, that almost might be bigger for the league. Obviously, we are very self-interested in Detroit getting a team, obviously. But the fact that that league sold out Toronto and Montreal, like 20,000 seats immediately Mm -hmm. is huge because you know they're going to be negotiating to play in those ranks next year now, which that revenue for the league and remember, it's one owner, all teams. So that money could go to a Detroit expansion team. I love it. All right, let's jump into overtime because it is late at night. Overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the Dub Dub Club, you get access to great benefits like automatically being entered into all the giveaways. For example, the two tickets were given away to every Red Wings home game and the Patrick Kane Pro Stock Stick, access to the bonus overtime episodes, and access to our Patreon-exclusive Discord community. You allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, produce some really great content like Expected by Whom, hosted by Prashant Iyer and Sean Shapiro, and continuing to make this show bigger and better. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. All right, let's go through and take some questions. Eric Asmus says, sometimes I wonder why did Eisman do the trade for Petrie? You already had Hall, and why wouldn't they do the Petrie trade before signing Hall so they didn't have to do the signing at all? So I'm going to jump in here and say Petrie wasn't available at the time. There's a sequence of events that made Petrie available. Eisman liked Petrie, and I don't think Eisman would have done the Hall deal if he could have gotten Petrie at the time. And if you're saying, well, that's even worse, I'm just communicating the knowledge I have. I think Eisman would have done just Petrie and not Hall because Hall came with the term and a higher price and he would rather have had Petrie retained at just one more year. And the fact of the matter is it was a mistake. They both were a mistake. I actually had time for the Petrie trade because I thought if you shelter him, you've seen what Petrie can do and it's not actually all that bad. 
But it he was took worse a, than expected. He took a big step off this year, yeah. Also, it was shorter and cheaper. Yeah. The Hall deal was bad from day one. You you were hoping for – you were hoping that it would be invisible, really. And it just was not it, – it's just not worth the, the term of the money. Join the Dark Sider says, how do you think the recent losing skid affects Kane's chances of re-signing in Detroit, both from his perspective and our perspective? Uh, bad on both. Losing, nobody's having fun. It's like... No, I, I, nobody I, makes their decision over like a short period of time, but it definitely sours you a little bit for sure. If this streak is the reason they miss the playoffs, then it's hugely impactful because if they miss the playoffs, that's going to be the biggest factor, right? If they can't make yeah. it this year, what hope would he have for next year? But... Yeah, and, well, let's call a space bit. If they miss the playoffs, it is going to be because of the stretch. So do with that information what you will. Everything I've I've been able to gather is that it's such a great fit. Why would you change it is, seems to be the sentiment. True. But when it, winning changes things, and so does losing. So I, I think it's too early to tell. I think it you have to at least think about it if you're both Kane and Detroit. Uh, Debrinket Lady, and this is just a comment on the PWHL game, which was nice to see, says, I took my daughter to the PWHL game at the LCA and was absolutely blown away by the game and the atmosphere of the crowd. It was awesome seeing so many young girls in the crowd and how happy they all were to be watching pro women's hockey. And the game was fantastic. Do you think the PWHL will expand anytime soon? That is absolutely their plan uh, because I think a team in Detroit would be amazing. Detroit has to be on the short list of teams. There's Don't underestimate how much competition there's going to be for expansion teams, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Washington. They're going to want to go out west sooner than later. I do think Detroit will get a team eventually. I'd be equally, I'm not, I don't know if surprise is the right word, equally surprised if it was next year or 10 years from now. It'll happen, but they're not expanding six teams a year every year. So it'll be a process. BLCD says you can rebuild the roster for next year. Who makes the cut from this season? You can eliminate two contracts, call up minimum one rookie and sign one UFA. Oh man, I am not nearly well versed in the UFA. So I can just, I th- I, I think UFA from this team. Oh, okay. And I get to punt any two contracts two I want contracts. off this team. Ooh, well, you sorry. Do. Cop's gone first for sure. He's not, well, it's hauling cop. It's, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else more expensive on longer term, but yeah. Sherratt is more expensive by 1.35 million. But, but he's he, also semi-useful most of the time. And if you had third pair Ben Sherratt, that's... Yeah, no real sneaky bad contracts up front that are coming to mind. So yeah, Cop and Hull, gone. The one UFA I would bring back would be Kane, and I'm only allowed one prospect? Minimum one. One young player. Minimum? Yeah. Oh, if it was up to me, Edvinson, Johansson, and uh, Casper are up next year, and there's no debate. Edvinson. I understand the downsides of three rookies, but I don't care. Edvinson, if Johansson plays his way onto the team, and if Casper or Mazer or anyone else does, great. Yeah, flip a coin. Whoever has a better camp between Casper and Mazer, I want one of the forwards up at a minimum. The reality is it might be Danielson. It could be. That's actually a really great point. Uh, Reed giving us a... a Update on Danielson says, hey, boys, long-time listener, first time writing in. That's a lie. Miss you, Reed. <laughs> says, on Friday, my wife D and I watched the Portland Winterhawks systematically dismantle the Tri-City Americans 11-1, to where our boy Danielson had two goals, two assists, and was the first star of the game. As usual, D was watching closely and taking notes, so here's another edition of D's Danielson Dispatch. Always knows where to be, patient and sneaky, pink cheeks, nice to his billet family, good at avoiding collisions, and tall. Brad could never. As always, any and all feedback is appreciated as D develops her new career in scouting. Well, come to our prospect profiles. But in all honesty, I, the, I like Danielson's hockey sense, and that's just feeding off what you just said, Brad. Like, he could actually make some noise on, on this roster. He had a great camp this year. It's also worth noting, he's the same age as Casper. Nobody mentioned Axel Sandin Pelka, too. I'll put him in as my dark horse. Nope, nope, shut up. It's my opinion. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Sorry, Evan. That's your, thank you. Clint Banesh says, with the league eventually expanding, does the season go beyond 82 games? I will die. No, absolutely not. I think they're destined for it. Shut no. up. No. Yeah, I, I think it's just shut up for you forever. Joseph Barry says, if you were Steve Eisman, what are your three moves you're making this summer and why? Shipping out at least one bad contract. Pay an asset to do it if you have to. 
making roster spots available for rookies. I don't care. That's that's my top priority this offseason above all else. It's a joke that there's only two players on this team under the age of 24 right now, fresh out of a rebuild. You need a huge youth movement next year because, hey, who cares? I don't know if a move gets done. You really have to start scouring for that top six forward, like that impact forward. Call every GM, see who's available. If not, Gibson. Ship out contract, hopefully contracts. Yes, that bring in youth. Support them by getting better goaltending. Gibson. And if you can, yeah, top six. It's it's all positions, but you it's kind of that, you have that to top do. end forward's evergreen until it happens. It doesn't necessarily have to happen this year, but by the time you plan on winning some playoff rounds, you need it. Tyler Toffoli would have been a nice ad. The it, dirty secret is like eight teams in the league have actually don't have a need for a top end forward. Like they don't have room at most. Like everyone needs top end forwards. Tyler Bertuzzi is a UFA. What's Anthony Mantha doing? Heard he just was bring the boys back. <laughs> just, just Reunion bring, tour. Just bring back Larkin's friends. Yeah, why not? Correct me if I'm wrong. Mantha Bertuzzi and Anthony C are all UFAs. Is and Anthony C UFA? And they can all score. Is Nick Jensen a UFA as well? No, he's, he's uh, got some okay. term left. I wasn't sure. No, Anthony C has one more year, and he has a Chicago contract. So that's he's one more year at $4.25 because they just hand out money over there. Oh, right yeah. That's, well, Chicago will happily retain. We can get him cost controlled cheaper. <laughs> He's only played third. Like, eh. We'll, we'll We're we'll getting just... the band back together, Ryan. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Last question here from Mr. Kuzi says, just out of curiosity, how unprepared, with how unprepared and unmotivated the team is, at what point does coaching get questioned? I understand Lalone isn't on the ice, but it seems like the message isn't getting through. In terms of actually being on the hot seat, probably not this year. Are there conversations being had in management right now about what's going on? Oh, there better be. Man, like aside from the fact that, yes, obviously the people who are the most pissed off are the players and the coaches. Management, yeah, is not thrilled about this. Oh, Eisenman's probably the angriest person in that building. And I don't think like everyone, like Brad said it earlier, there's like two guys who aren't in question here. And that goes up to coaches too. And it goes up to management too. It's It's all of them. The only two players... In this entire players, the only two people in this entire organization, if we're talking like hockey ops and whatever, that don't deserve any blame over this stretch is Dylan Larkin and Lucas Raymond. (laughs) Everybody else deserves some blame for how it's going. And don't forget forget the biggest culprit as to why, and this is what we're closing the podcast on, and I really mean this point. The biggest culprit as to why this is going poorly right now is because Evan missed that episode and let us get too optimistic. It's Evan Lopsinger's fault. Don't Uh, forget it. Every loss just makes me think about how hard current day Ryan would punch Chelios jersey retirement Patrick Kane overtime winner Ryan in the face. Head off of my shoulders. Like I would have put my nose through the back of my skull. That that episode was the biggest argument against analytics because the math was so good. I've never, (laughs) the vibes this year have never been so high and so low. You know, I asked your wife, I said, hey, is Evan wrong all the time and is everything his fault? And she actually confirmed it, which is why we know it is. Even though she says I'm wrong all the time. (laughs) Oh, Oh, no, we just started a fight with a bit. (laughs) Hold on. Shh. Let him go. (laughs) I'll save that one for the Patreon exclusive (laughs) where I know she won't. (laughs) <laughs> here. And if Mel snitches, I'll be pissed. <laughs> and trust me, she will. Catherine, I'm sorry. All right, folks, we're going to wrap up the Winged Wheel podcast. We're going to be back with you on Wednesday. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. This is, uh, as Evan said, the highs have been high and the lows have been, wow, they just keep getting lower. But we're always going to be here to talk Red Wings hockey with you, and we always appreciate you tuning in. Uh, to Labatt Blue Light, thank you so much for supporting this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. And to all of our listeners, new and old, thank you for tuning in. To our name-level supporters on Patreon, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grant Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conet, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Al the Octopus, Carl Brutan and Analuski, Carl Provi, Susan High Five, Clip Clop Nanny, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Fear the Goalie, God Creatives, Give Blood, Fight Probert, 
Have you ever drank Bailey's from a shoe? Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kalen Wood, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, RA, Red Feather Desert Dogs, Ryan, 50, Hannah Cap, Hannah, Scott Martin, Skeletor, brand new name level supporter. Welcome to the Dub Dub Club. Scree and Lube, that's what I appreciate about you. Tully, the Tulminator, and Abby, the Abdulcator. I put the commas in here to see if Ryan reads it in a funny way. Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, AB, Adam Rose, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Brian Fascia, Chuck Buff Chest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D Boss Snip Show, Derek James, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, insert clever hockey pun here, James Pridemore, Johnny Page, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, Jogan Rafferty Fan Club, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Michigan Boy in Avs Country, Ophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, Reed, Shahid Syed, Stephen the Hodag, the Mexinadian, the Hat One Two Three, Tom Iserplan, Respector, new name level supporter, Wings fan in St. Louis, X formerly A Aaron, and your second favorite patron. Thank you also very much. We'll talk to you Wednesday. Hopefully, there's a win between now and then. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.